Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on today's installment of the Reorg webinar series. We'll get started shortly. Today we'll discuss Talon Energy's recent Chapter 11 filing from the Reorg America's legal analyst team. I'm Sean Daly, and joining me today are my legal colleague, Kathy Ta, as well as senior financial analyst, Nick Williams. A replay of this webinar with slides will be available on the Reorg website within 24 hours, uh, if you're already an existing Reorg subscriber. Next slide, please. Today, we will provide an overview of the situation, the company, the debtor's proposed path forward, um, how various moving parts of that plan could impact unsecured recoveries, as well as a few criticisms of the proposed case path. There will be a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our prepared remarks, but feel free at any time during the presentation to use the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen to lob in any questions. So let's get started. So just to give you a few high level points that we'll dig more into and hear more about more from Kathy and Nick. So most of Talon's generation assets filed for chapter 11 on May 9th. Importantly, the Cumulus uh, growth subsidiaries and parent Talon Energy Corp still controlled by pre-petition private equity sponsor Riverstone remained out. Uh, we'll hear why some people are, are a little critical of that. Um, why is Talon in bankruptcy? No other way to put it than their, their hedging program did not uh, work as advertised. They ran into a bunch of additional collateral, including cash collateral posting requirements, which just soaked up all their liquidity. So here we are. Uh, the company was negotiating with some secured creditor groups starting last fall, but on the petition date, lo and behold, they file with an RSA and a short plan term sheet with a Kirkland represented ad hoc group of unsecured bondholders. So big picture, the proposed plan is secureds, some muni debt, some other non-debtor uh, entity obligations, all supposedly paid off, paid in full, unimpaired, and unsecureds are the fulcrum. We'll hear more about this from Nick, uh, but this ad hoc notes group has also proposed a backstop, which could be a, a pretty large relative to the size of the outstanding pre-petition debt rights offering, which would you know, have a, a nice big dilutive effect. Uh, a couple secured groups have expressed reservations about the plan. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And the company has dip financing, which should last it for sort of anticipated, you know, potentially upwards of a year long case. So Nick, could you start taking us into Talon, the company, please? Thanks, Sean. So on this slide, you see Talon's simplified capital structure as of the petition date. Talon has about $2.9 billion in secured debt at, issued out of its Talon Energy Supply entity, uh, about $1.33 billion in unsecured notes issued by the same entity, $231 million in muni debt, and $330 million in debt at the LMBE entity, which is a, a non-recourse subsidiary. Uh, this is a simplified capital structure. There's a more fulsome capital structure available on the reorg site. And um, so Sean, as he mentioned, is going to touch uh, on some of the secured credit, creditor considerations later in this presentation. But under the current RSA, um, as we noted, secured creditors being paid in full. So really, we're going to focus a little more throughout this presentation on treatment for the unsecured notes. Uh, but first, we'll talk a little bit about the, you know, the underlying business and the underlying assets. If we could go to the next slide, please. So this image summarized, summarizes Talon's power plant fleet. Uh, Talon's is a Talon is a merchant power generation company with a portfolio of power plants primarily based in the PJM region. Uh, PJM is an RTO or regional transmission organization that oversees generation activities in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and a number of other states. Uh, I, I think what I want to really call out immediately here is Talon's nuclear plant, Susquehanna. 
So as you can see, Talent has one nuclear plant and the rest of its plant portfolio is, is either nat gas or coal-fired. Uh, just to put some numbers around how important Susquehanna is to the business, uh, you know, running at 100% capacity, Susquehanna would generate about 20 million megawatt hours of electricity in a given year. And it runs close to that 100%, you know, it runs in 90% capacity factor range. And, you know, it's really just offline for refueling or, or scheduled outage or maintenance or what have you. In 2021, talent as a whole generated 35.7 million megawatt hours of electricity. So if you think about, you know, Susquehanna running close to that 20, it contributes more than half of talent's generation in, in 2021, uh, despite, you know, being a, a relatively small portion of, you know, talent's total, you know, main plate capacity of, of 12,000, you know, almost 13,000 megawatts. So if you kind of run the numbers and through that, right, the implied capacity factor for the rest of the portfolio backing out Susquehanna is around 17%. And, you know, what this tells us is Susquehanna runs a lot and is, is you know, a significant contributor to the, to the plant, to the company's overall cash flow, whereas the Nat gas and coal fired plants are arguably, you know, kind of less efficient and are more marginal suppliers of, of generation. Next slide, please. Here we're showing a snapshot of, of Talon's historical financials. Uh, we present them in this slide, uh, which is also available, you know, for download on, on the site, um, a little bit differently than, than the company presents in, in their historicals. And I'll, I'll kind of walk through this, this quickly. So, you know, at the top line, we have generation uh, for the LTM period ended September 30th, which is, you know, the last time we got full financials from the company. Uh, and, and the implied kind of realized energy revenue and total energy sales from that generation. And then on the next line, we have capacity revenue. And I, I think I'll, you know, stop for a second and just make sure we talk about capacity revenue as a concept. So PJM holds what we call, if you could uh, go back to the prior slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so PJM holds capacity options and, and capacity options allow companies like Talon to bid their power plants into the auction and commit to have their plant online and generating power if called upon by, P by PJM. And in return for that, uh, commitment they receive, you know, whatever the auction clearing price is. So the last auction in May of 2021 for the 22-23 capacity period, Talon said it cleared about 80% of its PJM uh, megawatts available. And, you know, I think that 80% number is an important distinction to the capacity factor numbers that we talked about on the prior slide, right? While those nat gas and coal plants might not run a lot of the time, you know, they still are significant participants in capacity auctions and therefore, you know, contribute meaningfully to the capacity revenue that talent is able to generate. You know, the last thing I'd like to touch on on this slide is, is you know, just we break out the hedging P&L and, and already you can see here, you know, the impact that hedges, the company's hedge portfolio has on its profitability. Not saying that, you know, that's specific to talent or necessarily a bad thing, right? All of, all of the IPPs, you know, generally hedge, you know, to a significant degree. Uh, talent looks to hedge, you know, well upwards of 70 to 80% of its, its forward generation expectations for any given year. Uh, but we break out, you know, hedging PL and then we show, you know, two kind of, I guess, distinct versions of profitability, right? So open EBITDA being, you know, how much the, company is able to generate, excluding the impact of realized hedges, and then hedge deep it up in, you know, after that, after that impact is baked in. Uh, we'll turn to the next slide now. So on this slide, we're, we're showing the company's projections. Uh, these are from cleansing materials, which, which the company filed uh, shortly after it, after it filed for chapter 11. Uh, you know, immediately what jumps out, I think, is, you know, you see both on an adjusted basis and for open EBITDA, the company's projecting significant improvements in 22 and 23 uh, versus historical. Uh, this, these projections, the company said are based on commodity pricing as of April 8th. Uh, and you know, simply put, 
we're not going to spend a ton of time on commodity markets in this presentation, but you know, looking at PJM pricing, you know, pricing has really blown out and, and significantly is significantly higher now than it was uh, you know, throughout 2021, uh, which you know, I think is, is driving a lot of the, the particularly obviously the open EBITDA improvements. Um, I think it's worth noting that a couple of things about you know, just how these projections are put together. They, they appear based on the interest expense to be based on the company's pre-petition capital structure. And I think we would expect you know, interest expense to be significantly lower based on the company's uh, expected capital structure at emergence. Uh, the other thing I'd say is you know, that, that, that cleansing deck is, is substantial, uh, you know, running well over 100 pages, and also includes the uh, dip projections into 2023, which I think are worth taking a look at, again, available on the reorg site. Uh, to, to kind of understand how the company's thinking about its its cash flow by month for dip sizing. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Kathy now. Kathy's going to talk a little bit about the org structure and then get into the RSA. Thanks, Nick. Um, next slide, please. So here we're presenting an organizational structure that's a simplified chart um, that kind of outlines uh, where the company's at in terms of um, its growth investment um, entities. But first off, let me direct your attention to uh, the dark blue box on your uh, left-hand side in the upper uh, left-hand corner. That's the lead debtor, that's Talon Energy Supply. And what I wanted to point out here is um, the lead debtor filed bankruptcy with 71 other affiliated entities, including subsidiaries. So there's a total of 72 debtors in bankruptcy right now. Right underneath Talon Energy Supply, that's the lead debtor. The first kind of light blue box there is Susquehanna Nuclear LLC. Now that's an entity also in bankruptcy, and that's the debtor that owns 90% of the debtor's key asset, the Susquehanna Nuclear Plant that Nick had mentioned previously. Um, if you move over to the right, uh, just slightly, uh, the first gray box at the top, that's the parent uh, company, that's Talon Energy Corporation, that's not in bankruptcy. And as you move further along to the right, you'll see all of the other gray boxes, which represents the cumulus growth entities, which are also not in bankruptcy. I just wanted to note here that Talon Energy Corp, uh, that's the parent uh, company that's owned by Riverstone, the equity sponsor here. And at the bottom of the slide, uh, we've also listed out um, an additional uh, set of subsidiaries that the LMBE subsidiaries that are also not in bankruptcy. So that's kind of the lay of the land in terms of who's in bankruptcy and who's not. Uh, next slide, please. Now let's get into the RSA terms. Um, as Sean mentioned earlier, um, the RSA is supported uh, by an ad hoc group of note holders holding 62.3% of all the claims. Um, they're represented by Kirkman and Ellis. Now, the mix of this group in terms of the claims they hold is very interesting. Uh, obviously, most of uh, the claims represented um, are unsecured notes, but this group also holds um, muni bonds. They are Series A um, bonds in the amount of about 69 million, as well as a limited amount of secured notes in the amount of 50 million. Top uh, holders of the claims include Rubik Capital Management, Nuveen Asset Management, and Castle Knight. And those parties are all listed up there on the slide. A couple of key milestones uh, under the RSA terms that I'd like to highlight is first uh, May 30. That's actually a milestone deadline for the consenting group of creditors to hold two thirds of all of the notes. They've got uh, September 16th targeted for disclosure statement approval and a confirmation hearing shortly thereafter in October on the 26th. Now, if you look down at the last key milestone date there, that's the effective day of May 9th in the following year, 2023, you'll see that the run rate here is about 12 months after the filing date. Um, the RSA uh, terms also contemplate customary debtor and third party releases, including two, uh, the equity sponsor Riverstone. However, uh, that equity uh, release is subject to a Talon global settlement, which is pending, and um, we don't see any settlement just quite yet. Uh, next slide, please. 
Now, in terms of the overall treatment and classification of claims, I think the big picture here, as Sean uh, touched on in his introductory remarks, is the idea is um, to pay everyone, everyone above unsecured claims, because the unsecured claims are the fulcrum, right? And um, other claims then would also be unimpaired with existing equity canceled. So let's go step by step in terms of breaking this down. In terms of secured claims, we've got the DIF facility. They're slated to be paid 100% in cash. We've got secured claims, which consist of revolving credit facility claims, first lien term note claims, first other first lien obligations. Here, the RSA contemplates that they would also be paid in cash or they've got the option to roll their claims into new exit debt. But otherwise, the bottom line is they would be left unimpaired. So just keep in mind for secured claims, the unimpaired treatment is either cash or new exit debt. Um, Sean also mentioned that there are uh, obligations at the non-debtor entities, specifically that at the um, LMBE subsidiaries. And with these facilities, they would remain in place or be refinanced at emergence. Now, in terms of other claims, before we get into the focus here, which would be the unsecured claims, um, the other claims consist of a mix of muni bonds. Here, the RSA term sheet contemplates that series B and C would be unimpaired. Uh, pension obligations and the related collective bargaining agreements would also be unimpaired and otherwise assumed. And the other thing that I just wanted to highlight here is asset retirement obligations would also be unimpaired. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of focusing on the unsecured, the folk group, um, group here, um, there are two contemplated groups at the unsecured level. Uh, the first are the unsecured notes claims, and the second are the general unsecured claims, including trade claims. Let's go through each now, one by one. With respect to the unsecured notes claims, uh, they're going to be uh, given a pro rata share of 100% of new common equity, less new common equity that could be given to the unsecured claims uh, down below, meaning the general unsecured claims uh, folks. And um, all of this is subject uh, to dilution from the rights offering and a 12% management incentive plan. Under the RSA term sheet, I wanted to also highlight that there's a potential, potential direct investment that could be offered to the unsecured holders in a to-be-determined allocation with a to-be-determined structure and form. Uh, one thing to highlight here is the RSA term sheet also contemplates continued funding in the cumulus entities here, um, consistent with the DIP budget. Now, with respect to the second group of unsecured claims, those are the GUCs and the trade claims. They're slated to get their pro rata share of cash or equity. It's unclear right now which they're going to get, but either, either form of treatment they get will be coming from respective pools. Um, if they get equity, it will also be subject to the same sources of dilution. Now, moving on to sources of equity dilution. Uh, Nick already mentioned, um, as well as Sean, that there's a huge rights offering here, which Nick will get into the details too. And the other source of equity dilution is the 12% management incentive plan. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Nick now to get into the details of the rights offering. Thanks, Kathy. So, you know, off the bat, and we've touched on this a couple of times, the, the key with this rights offering is that it, it can flex in size. Uh, and that flex is, uh, you know, in the, in the restructuring term sheet is predicated essentially on how much cash Talon has at emergence. So, you know, the rights offering amount will be based on meeting a projected net debt amount and a minimum liquidity requirement at emergence. And we're going to touch on the sources and uses on the next slide here, but essentially, you know, it will be, for lack of a better word, a plug to, to meet that, the company's uh, liquidity requirements. The participation in the rights offering is available to all unsecured note holders, you know, subject to kind of usual carve outs around um, legal ability to participate. But there is a quote unquote direct investment allocation of 30% for the backstop parties. So, what that means is, you know, this backstop group, the Kirkland Ellis group of bondholders will hold back 30% of the rights offering to allocate among themselves. And then all bondholders, including the ad hoc group, will participate pro rata in the other 70% of the total rights offering amount. 
again, we're going to touch on proceeds on the next slide, but but essentially, along with that, with an exit facility, proceeds from the rights offering will pay off the secured claims. The rights offering comes at a 25% discount to plan equity value, which is predicated on a 4.5 billion total enterprise value. Uh, as we note, the, the rights offering is flexible in size, but 1.3 billion of that rights offering amount has been backstopped by the ad hoc group, the unsecured ad hoc group. Uh, and as you know, is customary, there is a backstop fee uh, associated with that backstop amount, or 20% of the backstop amount. Uh, next slide, please. So on, on this slide, we've pulled this from the debtor's cleansing materials again, and essentially what this shows is, you know, based on their preliminary, preliminary assumptions, how they're thinking about sizing for the rights offering. You know, so sources of cash to, to effectuate their plan include the uh, $1.5 billion exit term loan, and a, in this case, $1.65 billion rights offering, along with a pre-emergence cash balance as of June, 2023 of 1.33 billion. Now, I think you know, the key focus here really should be the 1.33 billion as of, as of June of 2023. If we look at the dip sizing analysis, also in those same projections, the debtors in that analysis suggest they'll have 1.8 billion in cash as of June 23 and 1.9 billion in cash as of October 23. And, and I think this is a, a relatively unusual plan construct because you know the, the, the amount of time that the debtors are going to be in bankruptcy is significant you know, well into next year, but they expect to generate a lot of cash during this pendency of the, of the chapter 11 cases. And, um, you know, as we kind of outlined in the prior slide, you know, the way to think about this is if the debtors come in and say, hey, you know, we have $1.8 billion in cash as of June 23, the rights offering proceeds required to fund the plan will be reduced such that the cash balance remains 155 million post rights offering. Uh, next slide, please. So in this slide, this is pulled from a, a model we, we published on our site and which is available for download on our site and you know, happy to chat about it with people uh, in more detail. But you know, we, we put out this red offering model and you know, our analysis and based on our assumptions, we came to the conclusion that the non-ad hoc bond, bondholders uh, would recover about 78 cents on the dollar uh, under this plan construct, you know, relying on the debtor's valuation of, of 4.5 billion for, for enterprise value. Um, and again, you know, the key question here is, is, well, what happens when this rights offering flexes up or down? So, you know, you, you can go into the model and, and change your assumptions around sizing. Uh, if we were to reduce the rights offering amount to 1.15 billion from the 1.3 billion that we're using as our kind of base case here, recoveries would increase to 89.5% from 78%. So, you know, my point there is, is simply that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, essentially a lot of leverage to ultimate recoveries based on what the sizing requirements end up being, you know, when they do effectuate this plan. The other, obviously, kind of, you know, key point here is, is the plan talks a lot about, okay, bondholders in, are entitled to 100% of the equity. That, subject to dilution, that dilution is really, really significant. So again, you know, working through our assumptions on, you know, how the size of the equity incentive plan, um, among other things, this model spits out that the post dilution bondholders will receive about 30% of um, post reorg equity, right? So, you know, a significant amount going to the ad hoc group in the form of direct investment rights in the form of the backstop fee, um, as well as to the rights offering participants as a whole. Finally, uh, you know, just to kind of walk through the difference here, you know, if we look at the unsecured recoveries, we're showing two line items, right? One is the dollar value of their equity that they receive on account of their claims. And the second line item, the 230 million, is the dollar value of their, uh, of, of their right to participate in the rights offering. On the ad hoc group side, you know, they, 
they also have you know that dollar value of their their bondholder claims as converted and their their participation in the rights further they have their you know recoveries from the 30 percent holdback the direct investment and their backstop fee so you know material difference here in recoveries between the average bondholder, as it were, and an ad hoc group or, or backstop group participant. Uh, so, uh, as I said, the, the, the full model is available for download, and uh, I'm happy to talk more through this with people. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sean now, who's going to discuss some of the outstanding legal issues that remain for the debtors to resolve. Thanks, Nick. So continuing on the theme of sources and, and uses of cash, uh, potential interesting wrinkle on petition date, Talon Montana, which currently holds the company's 30% interest in one of the coal strip Montana coal-fired generating units, uh, brought a fraudulent conveyance suit against its former parent, PPL. So in short, this box used to hold some hydroelectric generation assets and then some coal assets, including coal strip and another facility that has since been shut down. And so what Talon Montana is trying to get back is the proceeds that the parent received from selling off all those hydro assets in 2014, throw some different numbers around $900 million um, gross sort of came in. And then 733 is the, the post-tax number that's cited in a couple different places. Uh, so some, you know, some interesting things from the complaint, which make it seem facially kind of interesting from a constructive fraud perspective are that, okay, this box was maybe marginally profitable when it held hydro and coal assets. Uh, there were already a lot of, you know, legacy liabilities attached to the coal fired generation and, and the outlook was not good in the company's internal business plan. Uh, in one of, well, I think the ultimate purchaser of the assets when initial bids were coming in said, all right, um, in making up the number slightly here, you know, we'll pay you $750 million just for the hydro assets. Or if you force us to take everything in the box, we'll pay you like 400, 450. Uh, so ascribing some negative value to the coal. And then when those hydro assets were sold off to the third party purchaser, proceeds came in up to the parent. The, the allegation is, hey, you left this box now with only the, the, the loss making coal assets as an uh, in, in insolvent box. So there was a state court lawsuit challenging the transaction filed in Montana in October 2018 by the Talon Montana um, pension fund or retirement fund. What's interesting, I, I think, you know, in not weighing into the merits or whether there will actually be any recovery, but if you assume for a second that there is some amount of recovery that comes back into the Talon estates, there could be some, some potentially interesting implications based on when that happens. So uh, like I said, there's a, a prior suit that the, the debtors are kind of glomming on to here, maybe to speed it up, but it's been going on since 2018. Uh, obviously defendants don't want these, these things necessarily to get resolved. So, well, there might be, let's call it a settlement with PPL that resolves this. If you get that cash in pre-effective date, pre-dip pay down, the dip lenders appear to have uh, a kind of typical lien on proceeds of avoidance action. So, you know, if there was a, a question about how you're going to pay off the dip, they, you know, they could get first look at that. But otherwise, just a, a fungible source of cash for the debtors to go effective, as Nick talked about, if you get more cash in, if that then in turn decreases the amount of rights offering you need, that can be better um, for unsecured on the whole. However, and this is you know maybe where it gets a little bit more interesting, there's no reason it needs to be settled for the plan to go effective. And so if that cash, assuming everything else, you know, minimum liquidity requirement of the, the plan construct, if everything goes according to plan and any proceeds come in, post-effective date. I mean, that's just excess cash on the balance sheet, which is a nice capital allocation problem to have and maybe looks ripe for a, a one-time special dividend to the uh, reorg equity holders, all these, these current unsecured note holders. Next slide, please. 
So to, to kick the tires on some of the reasons, there are a bunch of secured ad hoc groups who I, I mentioned all the way back at the top where negotiating with the company starting last fall. Uh, they've said, you know, listen, all well and good that you're proposing to pay us in full, but we have some skepticism. Uh, they're sort of sort of aligned. And in fact, they both co-retained Cool Hand. There's Naking Group, a King and Spalding group that hold two thirds plus of all the secured debt, including 100% of this commodity accordion facility that the company only raised in December. Uh, and then there's a Paul Weiss crossholder group, which has a little bit more diverse interest in a, you know, a, a non-negligible amount of unsecured claims as well. Uh, so some of the, the concerns, I mean, right off the bat, the debtors are anticipating over the next year when they're generating all this cash that Nick talked about, that they'll be able to, again, hedge a pretty high amount of their generation. So the King and Spalding group in a reservation of rights before the first day hearing says you know, politely, but all right, well, your hedging program is what got us into this mess. How are, how are we supposed to have confidence that, yeah, sure, you're going to execute in a better way over the course of the case? Uh, they kind of call out, again, maybe some of the cash flow generation assumptions are a little aggressive. They're just sort of worried about, I guess, this potential that they could bear the downside. Uh, while others get the benefit of the upside. They bring this up also in the context of, okay, well, Riverstone has some common equity interests in these non-debtor entities that have stayed out, the, the cumulus boxes. What's the valuation on those? Did they really contribute any value or are they just kind of holding on to them, uh, to those equity interests in, in a way that maybe doesn't merit the scrutiny of a UCC investigation? Uh, also have some concerns with the dip say, you know, it's, it's pretty rich for the debtors right now to, to say, oh, uh, unsecured is clearly the fulcrum. We're going to pay you secured in full, yet you're not giving us current cash pay interest as adequate protection. We'll object to that. That doesn't change by the, the final hearing. And then uh, I don't know how much time we really need to spend on this, but the commodity accordion facility, some liens that maybe weren't recorded until within the preference period. Uh, Paul Weiss Crossholder Group brought this up and said, uh, you know, Your Honor, this is a, a materially sized issue, but we think it can be resolved consensually. Uh, you know, you can sort of debate the utility to different parties in the in the case of going through that litigation. Uh, but it, it is a, a, a thing that's there. I just don't think for anyone who may be calling back and saying, oh, man, is this Chesapeake 2.0? I uh, personally don't don't think so. The facts are a little different here. Next slide, please. And then just to finish off, this is, is kind of a, a resumption or a, a consolidation of a few of the dates that Kathy mentioned earlier. We've got some upcoming ones. UCC was just appointed, uh, so we may hear something from them soon. June 8th, second day hearing. Some milestones in the RSA uh, for these consenting creditors to hold essentially two thirds or more in principal amount of the unsecured notes, which they, they weren't quite at as of the petition date. Uh, and then, you know, well, there was a, a form of backstop commitment letter filed on the docket with the first day pleadings, not executed. So that's, that's kind of another upcoming, you know, will these parties actually have finalized commitments? Uh, one other criticism of the secured groups is related to Riverstone Okay, sure, you have this placeholder in the, the little plan term sheet that you threw together that you'll come to a global settlement um, by mid-August, 90 days. Okay, we'll see. That's a, you know, it could be a quick timeline, try and get everyone moving in the same direction. Um, confirmation in the fall, maybe before Judge Isger steps down from the, the complex Chapter 11 panel at the end of the year, maybe one of his last big confirmation hearings. Uh, and then, as Kathy noted before, effective date kind of put a year from now, notwithstanding confirmation in the fall, the debtors have represented that, listen, we just have so many regulatory clearance obligations that we could wind up being in kind of post-confirmation pre-effective date period for a little bit of time, but not a, not a massive deal. So that is it for our prepared remarks, I think. Uh, we'll now switch over to Q&A. Let's check to see what has come in. A couple backstop and rights offering related questions. So Nick, 
just throw a couple of these over to you. Sure. Can you, okay, so let's see a couple. Um, can you explain the 30% direct investment again? Yeah, so, and I would, you know, say that this is based on our read of the term sheet, which uh, is certainly available on, this, on the site. It's also uh, about halfway through docket number 16, you can find the five page restructuring term sheet. So the term sheet specifies that, you know, 30% of the rights offering will be held back for uh, direct investment from the backstop parties. And, and our interpretation of how this should work is, you know, if, if for illustrative purposes, we say that the right total, you know, funding need for the debtors ends up being a billion dollars, uh, 30% or 300 million of that will be allocated to the backstop parties for them to, you know, divide among themselves how they see fit essentially. Um, and the other 700 million will be the rights offering portion that will be allocated to all bondholders, right? And, and we're not saying just non-backstop bondholders. Anyone with a bond, you know, have the ability to participate in uh, that, you know, in this, in this illustrative example, $700 million funding uh, requirement. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's funny if you're looking through the cleansing materials uh, for anyone who's familiar with the commitment creditors in LATAM, taking essentially a 50% allocation of a, a subscription right in their for their own direct allocation. That 50-50 split was in one of the, the pre-petition proposals, but I guess the debtors got it walked back to 30%. Uh, another, another quick one. Nick, for you, I think, uh, does the backstop amount also flex with the rights offering? Does the backstop amount also affect? No, no, it does not. So again, I, this this the flex in the rights offering is essentially TBD based on the debtor's ability to generate cash, whereas the, the backstop amount is is fixed as we as we read it. So you know the the group um, has committed to fund up to one point three billion. And you know it's a long commitment period, right? I mean, we're, we're talking well into next year. Uh, that backstop fee is associated with the 1.3 billion, and and you know if the debtors come back and say, hey, you know we didn't need the full 1.3, we need less. The debt, the, the the backstop group is still committed to be there for the 1.3, you know, regardless of what the actual need is. So we have no expectation that that would flex down. Similarly, it doesn't flex up, right? And, and you know, I'll, I'll speculate a little bit here, but you know, I would think that the backstop parties are saying, you know, we're there for the 1.3. If we end up really at the very high end of, of cash need here, you know, maybe, you know, these projections are, were a little bit more bullish than, than uh, they should have been. And, you know, we want the, we, we want the ability to come back and, and talk with the company about, you know, what's changed, you know, if we're going to write, let's say another 400 million or I guess 350 million of, of underwrite another 350 million of, of backstop. Um, so yeah, the short answer is no, backstop amount does not flex in the way that the rights offering flexes. Great, thanks. Um, Kathy, we've got a question here, I'll send your way. Uh, what about the absolute priority rule? How does that play into uh, trade treatment recovery? And I, I assume they're bringing it up in the context of relative to unsecured notes recovery. And Kathy, you're on mute. Thanks for spotting that. I knew I would do it at one point during this presentation. So what I wanted to say is generally um, taking a step back, we ought to see the unsecured note claims as well as the general unsecured claims, including the trade claims as all unsecured claims. So they should be on equal footing or par passu in terms of priority. And where the absolute priority rule comes into play here is in terms of ensuring that a dissenting class of claims are paid in full generally before any class of junior creditors get any recovery. 
And because they are uh, par passu, meaning in equal footing, um, they should be paid similarly because they are similarly situated claims. Um, generally, the principle is they should get equal or equitable treatment. How that gets defined is the open question. So under the RSA terms, we went over how uh, the unsecured notes claims will get um, their pro rata share um, and of the equity uh, rights offering, um, as well as 100% uh, of the new common equity, uh, less you know, certain uh, distributions if they were made to the general unsecured claims and subject to dilution. Um, so I think the punchline here is to the extent that um, general unsecured claims and trade claims um, get cash or equity, it's got to be in some equivalent or equitable amount when you compare it to the unsecured notes claims. But again, like I said, it's an open question what the form of distribution would be uh, for the general unsecured claims. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, the, a related question to that, and I'll just try and glom on to the end of your answer. How are you thinking about the potential size of the unsecured cash pool? How do you expect it will be funded? Um, I think, and you know, Kathy, correct me if, if you think about it differently, but uh, the idea is that on a percentage basis, whether trades getting cash or equity would have to be in approximately the same percentage recovery. And we just, we just don't know um, at this point, yeah. they're kind of blank placeholders. Yeah, for sure. Um, under the RSA term sheet, it's pretty much um, defined in terms of treatment for the general unsecured, that's the pro rata share of an unspecified amount of cash or equity. So I think it all remains to be seen, but the general principle uh, would apply. Similarly situated claims ought to be receiving equivalent treatment. Thanks. Uh, and we've got one follow-up on the backstop, just to confirm the backstop parties have the right to renegotiate above the 1.3 billion fixed amount. Uh, and that's that's right. And apologies, Nick, if I, I missed uh, you going through this one, but they're they're not committed. They're committed at 1.3. They have they retain the option, at least under the, the very short term sheet that we saw. If they want to go higher, they can, but they're under no obligation. Um, which is, as Nick noted, you know, if you're in that world, maybe under facts that you don't want to go higher. I'll take the next one. Does Reorg have a view on what happens to the make hole under the commodity facility? Is it possible that the preference issue can be used to reduce the make hole amount? Um, yeah, that's one of the, the questions where the answer writes itself. Um, Pre-petition term sheet from the secured groups where the, the holders have that facility, uh, you know, they made sure to write in sort of allowed amount of claims includes all the all the bells and whistles. And of course, the, the debtor's counter proposal uh, was just kind of silent on that. And in the existing restructuring term sheets, uh, the allowed amount of all unsecured claims is subject to the approval of the consenting creditors. So yeah, I mean, on the one hand, Isger has been pretty friendly to arguments for make holes and uh, contract rate post petition interest in the past, slightly different facts, unsecured debt in, in ultra comes to mind. Um, so on the one hand, you know, I'd, I wouldn't mind being in Houston, having to make that argument for the, the make hole. Um, and that's, and that is maybe where the, the preference issue comes up, you know, debtors say, all right, sure. Kind of push for your, your full claim amounts and then we'll just avoid your liens. Uh, but yeah, not a, not a bad take on that. That could be kind of the, the push and pull of, of a settlement on those, that mishmash of issues. Another, another quickie, I just wanna make sure of the 71 companies that fall under Talon Energy Corporation, only five question mark are in bankruptcy and the largest revenue energy generators, one of the five. Uh, no to the first part of that, yes to the second. So yeah, Susquehanna, the, the nuclear plant that Nick and Kathy talked about is in. Um, there are, I don't know, 70 plus, Kathy had the exact number, 70 plus talent subsidiaries that are in. Um, so yeah, you know, there aren't just five companies. Yeah. So just to clarify that 71 number, uh, not to be confusing, 72, 
72 total entities are in bankruptcy. I use the 71 to, um, in reference with who's the lead debtor, that was Talon Energy Supply, plus 71 other entities in, in bankruptcy. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Nick, toss this one over to you. Why are the Muni Series B and C treated differently than the Series A? Sure. So again, that's our read of the term sheet. And I don't think it's spelled out in detail, but it, it, it explicitly states that the Series B and C munis uh, will, be, will be deemed unimpaired or, or treated as unimpaired uh, and does not explicitly state the same for the Series A. Now, I think logically, you know, there, there are good reasons why that might be the case. The Series B and C munis have um, an LC wrap from a third party bank, which you know ensures that the ultimate holders recover in full. And that LC wrap is in turn backed by letters of credit under the Talon revolving credit facility. So you know the long and short of analyzing the recoveries from Talon's perspective is the munis are unsecured, but ultimately Talon is going to have to pay out the secured debt to make sure that those B and C tranches recover in full. The same does not hold for the tranche A of muni. And uh, you know, while it's, it's not necessarily clear to us whether that tranche A, which is 100 million, uh, would be grouped into kind of a duck and trade claim class or grouped into the unsecured notes class, we're, we're assuming, uh, you know, particularly because one of the ad hoc group members, the Kirkland ad hoc group members owns a large portion of that bond, we're assuming for our purposes that it'll be grouped into the, you know, unsecured notes uh, treatment class. Great, thank you. I'll take the next one. Why is a global settlement with Riverstone in 90 days important to ultimate approval emergence, as opposed to leaving those open for the emerged state to litigate? Um, two prong here, Riverstone, I'm, I'm sure would like a, a third party release and then it also goes back probably to the fact that they're, they're still retaining these common equity interests in some of the non-debtor, the growth entities that the secureds have, have kind of pointed out, you know, hey, um, is this, you know, has anyone done the, the valuation to say they, that there's value there, that they've, you know, contributed sufficient value to be able to retain that? Um, just let's take a quicker look. So to retain those equity interests, Get a release of claims. I'm sure they, you know, would want to get that done sooner rather than later. Next one for Nick. We've got a lot coming in for you. Uh, any reason the different unsecured tranche, tranches should trade at different prices currently? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the short answer is is no. There isn't really a difference. They should trade. Um, they should trade at different prices, you know, at least under the current RSA, right, they're all being treated the same. Um, some of those tranches are very small, right? So, you know, a couple of, you know, 20 million, $17 million tranches, and there may be some kind of liquidity issues or, or just pricing slight discrepancies on those tranches. Uh, that's not a great answer to why, you know, they're trading differently. I mean, I guess a more speculative answer might be, um, if this, if this RSA, you know, things were to go really well for the company, maybe, you know, you start asking about, you know, interest rates and unimpairment. Uh, but I think that's we're quite a long way away from that world uh, for now, at least. Uh, so I don't have a great answer to the question um, other than, yeah, maybe maybe a little bit of, of liquidity, liquidity issues on the small tranches. Great, thanks. Got one in here that I'll take about uh, retail, energy contracts, a uh, bunch of which the debtors moved to reject on the petition date. Um, one question about, you know, how can the company do this? How can they get away with it? Um, yeah, I mean, pretty, pretty deferential business judgment standard for a company to reject non-profitable burdensome contracts in bankruptcy. Uh, but the flip side is, yes, you can file a proof of claim. Um, I don't think they've set the claims bar date 
yet. Uh, and then someone asked about magnitude of claims. And the debtor said in that sort of omnibus motion to reject a bunch of retail purchase agreements that uh, if they continued to perform, they would lose on un undiscounted basis for the next call it three years that approximately $500 million. So, you know, if, if everyone shows up and files their proofs of claim, maybe that's, uh, you know, in that, in that ballpark of 500 million, maybe you can think about that as an addition to the uh, general unsecured or, or trade claims pool. Nick, we've got a couple for you on backstop fees. Could you explain how the backstop fee is calculated? What is the 20% backstop premium calculated on? And then another one along the same lines. Will the equity issued for the backstop fee be based on full plan equity value or the 25% discounted value? Yep. So our assumption here, and you know, it's, it's I would say how we usually see these things work and, and certainly how the team term sheet indicates it'll work, although it's not spelled out, is you know, there's a $1.3 billion backstop. So the backstop fee will be an additional, will be 20% of that, uh, you know, 0.2 times 1.3. Um, and as to, so you know, if you look through the term sheet, there's a, there's a quite a substantial amount of uh, wording around the backstop fee. It can be paid, you know, in cash, or in equity, uh, the option of the recipients, um, I believe, um, and can be paid up, paid over time in installments. Uh, and there's a you know a provision where if there's a new plan construct, uh, potentially the backstop parties will earn fifty percent of that backstop fee. You know even though they won't be backstopping a rights offering, but um, in the kind of straightforward case where everything goes as outlined we would expect that backstop fee to be paid in equity and for it to be paid at a 25% discount to plan value, you know, so essentially under the same terms as the rest of the rights offering. Great, thank you. Get down to the bottom of the barrel here. Nick, another one for you. How might the significant rise in power prices since April 8th which was the hedge pricing date in the cleansing materials have affected the company's liquidity during bankruptcy? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the key question. Um, I'll try and give a, a, a shorter answer. Um, you know, I think the whole backdrop here, right, is, is rising power prices, all else equal, are good for a company that produces power, right? But, but we're obviously here today because the company's liquidity issues um, were kind of exasperated by having to post collateral on its hedge book. Um, the same holds true now, right? Rising power prices, all else equal, should be good for talent. And I, and I think the one point here is, you know, we didn't discuss in a ton of detail, but the, the debtors were very um, open about the fact that they feel that they are under hedged or at least were under hedged as of the petition date and that they would be going to the market and that, you know, they've entered into these post petition hedge agreements specifically because they need the ability to go into the market and, and increase their hedge book size, you know, increase the, the degree to which they're hedged, you know, over period from petition date, you know, until, until, you know, basically as soon as possible. So, you know, as long as they uh, are not fully hedged, but are out in the market, you know, working to hedge at, at the at spot prices, you know, PGM prices today, um, or I should say kind of along the curve, I guess, uh, that should be beneficial, right? They should be able to um, you know, take advantage of, you know, as, as the question kind of points out, prices have risen further since that April 8th deck was, was put together. Um, and, and, you know, that's kind of, I think, the key story because, you know, as we outlined, if that means they have more cash at, um, at emergence, 
they would have less of a rights offering funding need. But you know, we haven't done the work yet, and it's certainly on the list. Um, you know, to try and think through, okay, you know, what is the company's, um, um, you know, what is the change to the company's projections based on on these rising prices? And it may be a very hard question to answer, you know, because we don't know where and how much the company has hedged thus far. Um, so yeah, that would be my my thoughts there. Thanks. Well, I I think that's a good place to leave it for today. Uh, you know, we're we're happy to to chat through through these issues. As as Nick noted earlier, if you're already a subscriber, please send any questions to customer success at reorg.com. Uh, a reminder: a replay of the webinar will be available on the reorg site within the next 24 hours. And a, a big thanks to everyone who joined us today, uh, Nick and Kathy. Thank you very much for your, your time and your insights. Thank you all and have a good day. Thanks, Thank Sean. You. Thanks, everybody.